Kim, thanks a lot for being here on our special day for Pleasure. our Skeptoid 13th birthday. Pleasure to be here. Happy birthday to you. So first of all, there is doubtless someone watching somewhere who doesn't know who you are. So can you give us the 10-second uh, introduction? I, I'm offended by even the possibility that there's somebody who doesn't know who I am. But I am, I'm Kim of Bader, um, an archaeologist, Central Connecticut State University. I do lots of field work, but I also sort of my side thing has always been looking at pseudo-archaeology or fringe archaeology or fake archaeology, or as Glenn Daniel, the famous British prehistorian, called it, bullshit archaeology. Now, he's a professional. He was a professional. All kinds of awards. So I feel it's okay for me to call it bullshit archaeology because Glenn Daniel did. <laughs> now, you, you, you mentioned all of that stuff that you, that you do dealing with the pseudo-archaeology and everything. And I, I, I reference your books uh, all the time in the, I appreciate the references that. I for my podcast. What, how many do you have? I think I've only got two. And, there's, is, there there's they are. my frauds book, Upside Down. Yeah, There's archaeological frauds. I, and here's my archaeological oddities. So this is, the, this is a pretty new one. This is I like never, a, a travel guide to the weird. I never knew that you could just flip the book over like that. I've always had to get upside down every time I've read it. Well, I was going to turn the, the iPad upside down, but I don't know if that would have worked, really. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've written a bunch of books, and including textbooks about you know, standard prehistory, like Past and Perspective is a world prehistory text. Um, but I've also written a book about um, one of the, the excavations that I conducted, the Village of Outcasts, which is a cool site up in northwestern Connecticut. Um, and... Uh, Oh, just so many fabulous books. It's, it's almost hard to remember all of them. <laughs> oh, and my, the latest things, I, one of the things that I try to do, and this was, I was inspired by students, really, is that when I teach my introductory courses, one of the, what's my goal? Do I want every student to remember what the half-life of radiocarbon is? That'd be nice, but that's unrealistic. What I really would like to do at the end of a student who's not a major, taking it for general education credit, um, at the end of the semester, what I would like for them to do is to be able to say, wow, that was actually pretty cool. And in my adult life, if I'm ever in an area where there's an archaeological site open to the public, I'm going to go because Fader showed pictures of that place. And it was really cool. And on that, on the, that basis, I wrote a book called Ancient America, 50 Archaeological Sites to See for Yourself. And it is, I call it a time travel guide. Isn't that clever? But it's, it's, it's places, it's all the usual suspects. Suspects, Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, Cahokia, but it's also a bunch of other incredibly cool sites with rock art and effigy mounds right here in North America, all real deal archaeology. And my hope is that when people engage directly, if no matter what they've heard on cable, when they see the actual archaeological site and see the artifacts and say, oh, okay, that's really incredibly cool. Yeah, people are pretty smart. They could have done that. And so it's almost a, it's a proactive way of dealing with some of the nonsense that dogs archaeology. That's that's actually your Twitter handle, 50 Sites Book, isn't it? Yeah, that's there yeah. you go. And uh, I know some people think that when I talk about my books that I am shamelessly flogging them. And that's not true. I'm very much ashamed. <laughs> but buy my books anyway. It's, you know. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done here. Uh, thank you all for <laughs> Good night, everybody. So, okay, the main thing that I that I want to talk to you about sure. is um, how to reach people who are believers in you know these alternate histories, alternate archaeologies, um, and and I was just talking with David Anderson about the same subject. And sure. one of the things that uh, we both always bring up is that all of these people are very sincere in their beliefs. They don't intend to believe anything that's not true. They've just been given enough bad information and they're susceptible to the same, you know, sensationalism and the, the attractiveness of that, that, that sure. we all are. And so how do you, how do you help guide people away? I mean, you get to deal with students, but I'm talking about people in the general public. How do you guide them away toward, uh, toward what's real? Right. See, yes, I deal on a daily basis. I deal with students, but because of the books and because I've done some TV, I do get emails. Um, my basic rule, I don't know if you need to bleep me out on this, is that if in the subject line of an email, I have trigger words. OK, Brian, I'm very sensitive. We, we are clean tagged, so spare me as much bleeping as you can, please. Uh, all right. <laughs> there, there are, let's just say that there are trigger words with lots yeah. of M's and F's in them yes. that people do put in their, 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 um, their subject lines and emails to let me know how they feel. 
You know what the truth is, Brian? I'm not going to reach those people. They're not looking for a dialogue. They're looking to yell at me. They're like, you know, the, the, the mentally challenged person on the streets of New York who when you walk by, they say, they give you the finger. It's right. like, what are you going to do? Stop and say, excuse me, why did you do that? What motivate? That's you, you can't have a conversation. You can't have a dialogue. And so people who just write me and tell me directly, I am part of a conspiracy to keep things quiet. I know the truth. Um, I'm a fool. I'm, an, I'm a blind idiot. I'm a bunch of other things that we won't, if we're clean tagged, I won't say it. There's just no point in my responding to those emails and saying, well, now let's sit down and talk about it. They don't want to sit down and talk about it. However, the vast majority of people who contact me are people who say, Vader, you just can't, you just have to admit, those pyramids were so hard to build. Those are people who I can say, yeah, you know what? And you watched a, a half an hour show or a 60 minute show in which a bunch of people talked and everybody had like their three minutes. You're not going to learn how the pyramids were built by watching television. What you got to do is you got to look at this book by Dieter Arnold called Building in Egypt. And you will see in that book the artifacts that have been found by Egyptologists, the artwork found by Egyptologists showing of Egyptians showing how they moved gigantic rocks. And then read that book. And if you are still unconvinced, contact me. And those people, every once in a while, I'll get an email back. Basically, they're shocked. Well, I guess you archaeologists really do know how this was done. Yeah, that's people who've worked for their entire lives on these on these topics really do have something important or interesting to say. And not somebody who's got a TV show with no background in it. And, and there's no it's very difficult in a TV show to get the depth that you need to have when you're discussing what are really pretty complex issues. So those are people, I do give out surveys every year um, to my students and I ask them mm -hmm. about ancient astronauts and ancient aliens, about Atlantis and a bunch of other stuff. And I basically, I apply a Likert scale, right? You know, strongly believe, mildly believe, I don't know, mildly disbelieve, strongly disbelieve. And the fact of the matter is the strong believers are a tiny percentage, at least of my samples. It's the mildly believe, I don't know, mildly disbelieve. It's, it's people in the middle. And these, those folks are reachable, absolutely. They're inter and why wouldn't people be interested in Stonehenge or Atlantis or ancient Egypt? And because they don't have direct access. I mean, archaeologists tend to speak amongst themselves. And you look at the articles that are, say, in American Antiquity, they really are not. Hell, some of the articles in American Antiquity are not accessible to me. I read them and I go, I don't know what they're talking about because I don't have enough background information. So it really is a lot about archaeologists. Jeb Card is, is a, a, a colleague of mine who's really good at this. Dave Anderson and me to an extent where we're saying we're, we're, we're bypassing all that crap and saying, let's talk directly to people about aren't these cool things that we've, we've discovered. And if you have questions about, but how did people do that? Ask us. Because I will tell you when we don't know, we'll tell you when we're not sure, but when we think we, we're pretty sure we know how it was done, we'll share that with you as well. And, you know, I, my favorite, I can't remember the, the physician's name, um, his, his, his phrase was, you know, when you hear, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. And so that's what I tell people. I say, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, it could have been aliens. But is that the first step? Is that where you're going to go first when we have all of these other very plausible explanations for for what happened? Um, one of the things that, that I will think, talk about briefly, you can cut it or whatever, is this whole notion about expertise. Uh -huh. There seems to be this, this perspective that being an expert is meaningless. If anything, it's bad. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Megan Fox had that show, Land of the Lost. Or Lost right, right. Whatever the hell it was. And at some point, somebody interviewed her and asked her, well, why are you? I mean, do you have any background in history or archaeology? And she said no, but presented that as a positive because all those scientists, they have blinders on and they have to please the other scientists and they, are, they, they have to think inside the box. So having no background at all, in fact, is a benefit because you're not restricted. Um, great story. I gave a lecture about the Cardiff Giant, obvious archaeological fake. It's in my, it's in this book right here, which is right side up. Great story. New York State. 
1860s guy finds a giant man, a petrified man. Turns out to be a statue, but it was presented as like the petrified trees in uh, Arizona and elsewhere as a, an actual man who was 10 or 11 feet tall who had become petrified sometime before or immediately after the flood. So I gave that lecture, great fun. I give that all the time. And I was approached by a gentleman at the end of the lecture. And he had two big fat ring binders filled with plastic sleeves with photographs. And he hands them to me, very nice guy, and says, Dr. Vader, these aren't archeological frauds, are they? So I looked at them. Immediately, now I'm not a geologist, but I have training in geology, I'm an archeologist. People, people adapted to geological landscapes, people use rock. I need to know a bunch about, and Pleistocene geology is something, I took lots of courses and I have a cat who's about to visit. <laughs> go down, Sedona, go down. He's really interested in archeology, span by the way. So anyway, um, I recognized what he was showing photographs of. They're glacial erratics. Now, this is something that geologists have found out and understood 1700s even in Europe, where, my God, there are these gigantic rocks, only they're out of place. They're out of place rocks. They are in a place where there aren't any other gigantic rocks. Or the raw material, completely different from the surrounding bedrock. And geologists long ago figured out, you know what could move those? Great, great tongues of ice can push these large boulders Geologists call them erratics. Um, if you go online, look up erratics in, in, their, in your search engine and look at the images, find all these really cool rocks. Very often they're miles away from their source, and sometimes they're a thousand feet higher than their geological source. Water can't do it, wind can't do it, they're erratics. Now, this is really important, what he said to me when I diagnosed these things based on photographs, so I wasn't definitive. I said, you know what, I really think these are erratics, they're great pictures. His response was, Dr. Fader, I don't know anything about geology, but I know those are not erratics. Think about that. How, in the, what, how is that a reasonable thing to say? You know, Brian, if you came to me today and said, Kenny, but how are these awful headaches? And I'm double vision and I can't sleep and I'm dizzy. And I say to you, Brian, I don't know anything about medicine. But I think if you cut back on your gluten, you'll be just fine. <laughs> oh, my God, don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Go People back. actually say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's, the, there's the deal. You know, if, if somebody can have – thinks that it's a rational, a rational thing to say is I don't know anything about that topic, the, the relevant, the most relevant scientific discipline, but I'm going to tell you something definitive about it. I tell my students, I say, look, honestly and for real, if in a conversation, whether it's about climate change or the, the value of vaccines or whatever else, if you can honestly say in that conversation, I don't know anything about the relevant disciplines involved, your best bet at that point is to shut up. Just admit, <laughs> I don't know, and I, don't, I, have, I do not have an informed opinion, so I will not say anything. Well, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But otherwise to say, well, well, I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. And that's, I mean, that drives, I think that drives scientists crazy. Although the CERN collider, that's going to kill the world. And a physicist will say, no, it can't. Here's the math. I don't, I don't know anything about physics, but you're wrong. Right, right. For real. And I think that, that there's this real, uh, this almost disease now in which having an expertise in a discipline should disqualify you from having it anything to say about it. And that's kind of, it, ultimately, it's really scary when you talk about medicine, especially. Um, so I just try to convince people, I tell them all the time, look, I'm not smarter than you, I'm not better than you, but I probably know more about archaeology than you do because I've devoted 40 more years, 40 or more years to the study of the human past. Does that mean I'm always right? No. But it means, you know, I'm right most of the time. And if you don't know anything about archaeology at all, you don't, I, you know, Dr. Peter, I know nothing about archaeology, but then the odds are, can you ever be right? Yeah, of course you can. What are the odds that you're going to be right? If you've never read a book on archaeology, if you've never done any research in archaeology, you've never written anything in archaeology, you've never gone to a conference where you've discussed archaeology with other people, with peers, then, you know, the odds are pretty long against you coming up with something that's going to overturn the archaeological orthodoxy, if that's even the word you want to use. <laughs> the orthodoxy, the dogma. Yes. 
I, I, I did an episode of the podcast once on uh, new logical fallacies, and I can't remember what I named this one, but it's the argument from lack of expertise or something like that. But Isn't that it, bizarre? It's, it's common. I hear it a lot from the UFO people who believe that every UFO is an alien spacecraft. And the explanation is, you know, we don't know what else it is, therefore, by process of elimination. Right. So exactly. What they're saying is, I don't know, therefore, I do know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Same, same thing. There's a there's a great there's a great Monty Python bit where this guy is um, it's, a, it's the vocational guidance counselor. And this guy walks into an office of somebody who's you know he, he wants to change his job. And so the John Cleese character says, well, "What do you do now?" And the guy says, "I'm an accountant, and I hate it. It's boring. It's dull." And the John Cleese character says, "Okay, but according to this test you've taken, you're that's what you're does that's what you're good at." He goes, "No, but I want something different." And the John Cleese character asks him. Well, what is it that you'd like to be? And he says, I'd like to be a lion tamer. And John Cleese says, do you have any background or knowledge about lion taming? And he says, well, yeah. And John Cleese says, oh, well, and what, what do you have? And he says, I have my own hat. It says lion tamer across the front. <laughs> and John Cleese says to him, hey, sir, if I call the gentleman at the circus and I say, I have a, an accountant here who'd like to be a lion tamer, the first question he asks will not be does he have his own hat? <laughs> so, so I tell people all the time, you just there are there are people out there wearing their archaeology hats, whatever the hell that is. That's that really doesn't count, you know. And there are there are a number of folks out there. You see, jo Josh Gates has his archaeology hat, his fedora, and uh, Giorgio has his archaeology hat. I don't care. I don't care what kind of hat you wear. What's your background? What's your knowledge in those fields? That's the only <laughs> thing that counts. I like how Giorgio's outfit gradually morphed. It didn't change all at once. It went from when he had the nice suit on in his initial right. appearances to like he would, you know, eventually change the jacket. Then he'd add a piece of, uh, you know, ancient looking jewelry. Uh, <laughs> and then eventually it came to the hat and the necklaces and everything. Oh, it's, and it's this kind of Victorian vibe, but also a hippie vibe. Um, Jason Calavito talks about that a lot. How it's at this point, ancient aliens is a lifestyle brand. They sell you this stuff. I mean, it's 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 a community of people like minded, I guess, but they all want to dress alike. I don't know. Hey, listen, it is what it is. Yeah, I only just learned that they have that history puts on uh, conferences and events oh, yeah. and things like that oh, that you absolutely. go to. I didn't you know get that. a picture taken with these guys and and autographs. It's we not really, Comic Con, really but only for. Here. We have to get a group of like a dozen of us and all go to one of those. Um, of, oh, God, what is it? A year, a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, a reporter from the New York Times came up and interviewed me about a, an alien conference that, you know, ancient aliens conference that he went to. And he had pictures of it. People, like, they dress up as like extraterrestrial aliens. It's like a Star Trek convention, but maybe they think it's real or maybe it's, maybe it doesn't even matter at that point. Real or not, it's just like, you know, super fun. Now, I've been to Roswell, and I think that a lot of Roswell is like that. It's like, real or not, let's all, you know, let's let's have at the at the you know at the Burger King have a big aliens welcome sign. And, uh, <laughs> and across the right. street from the museum, there's uh, the last time I was there, there's like a, a a window, a shop window, and they do like weddings there. So it's some kind of you know quickie weddings, and the picture in the front is a guy in a tuxedo and a woman in a bride, bridal dress, and they're extraterrestrial aliens. So, you know, it's all, it's all good fun. And maybe, that, maybe ultimately that's what we're, that's one of the saving graces we have, is there really is a pretty small, used, maybe it's getting bigger, a small proportion of people who take this up really seriously and believe really strongly. And then for a lot of other people, it's like ghost stories around a campfire. Like, wow, I don't know if that's real or not, but that's really entertaining it's scary it's interesting yeah. um my students are going to be different than a group of i do ask my students if they watch ancient aliens and again college students and they all know who giorgio is you all know the show the, then if you ask then the, the next question you ask is how many of you watch it small percentage how many of you take it seriously maybe there's one kid in a class of 90 who says yeah i think there's something to it so but you know as long as they're selling you know, laundry detergent or whatever the heck it is they sell in the commercials, they'll keep the show on. I just, and maybe this is my Pollyanna-ish um, perspective. Like nobody's stupid enough to really believe that stuff, right? So maybe it's just for entertainment. 
maybe I, and I I know people who will argue and I know no 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 it's really serious stuff and and maybe it's been getting increasingly serious with all this notion that it's all part of it's not these aren't spacecraft that are made out of you know nuts and bolts but they these are demonic presences and they're coming from other dimensions they're not extraterrestrials they're ultra terrestrials i don't even know what the hell that means and that it all has something to do with demons and and spirits and then you have people you know praying for donald trump because they think he's being beset by these democrat demons and you wonder is the world really this messed up maybe it is or maybe it's getting there my experience is that my personal experience is that most people in the regular world, and I'm talking about your barber, your grocery shop manager, your lawyer, your accountant, they do not ever think about these things. And they're just simply not part of their life. Right. However, once in a while, they'll have the TV on and they'll catch an episode of Hunting Hitler or Ancient Aliens or whatever it is. And they'll go, huh, that's really interesting. And it might stick in their head. And then when they find out what I do for a living, they'll always ask me, yeah, I, I, I learned something the other day about how the uh, the Nazis had uh, this occult uh, underpinnings and everything. I thought that was pretty interesting. And essentially everything that they will pick up from these shows is complete nonsense. And that's, to me, that's the most insidious part of all, because you've got people who don't think very much about this, but everything they know about it is wrong. Right. And that tells me that they're susceptible to this type of thinking that, you know, so much it, it, that extends to anti-vaccine and gluten is yeah. killing us all and everything else. Uh, yeah, but the gluten stuff is bad. Gluten's bad for you. Don't have, don't, don't have any gluten. <laughs> I, 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 think, I don't know if I was talking to you on Twitter about that, but, you know, I, I always, when I go to restaurants, I'm that jerk who asks the poor wait staff. Could you give me extra gluten? I'm not extra getting enough gluten, gluten in my <laughs> diet. So, you know, all that gluten you take out of the other stuff, just pile it on my plate. Um, and one of the things that I know we I talk about this with other archaeologists. Archaeology is a popular topic, and we wonder well, why aren't there really good, legitimate cable shows, cable series about real deal archaeology? And that, on the basis of my 50 sites book, I actually was contacted by two or three independent production companies talking to me about, well, okay, this is, sounds like a pretty cool idea. And in, at least in one case, they actually brought it to some trade show where they talked to the travel channel and the history channel and whatever other channels we went nowhere. Uh, and when they, when they, the, the, the um, producers had talked to me, they said, well, here's the thing. The, what sells shows these days, I'll give you two words, treasure and mysteries. And they go, and they say, about your these 50 sites, these are all Mesa Verde, Cahokia, Three Rivers Petroglyph sites, Crystal River, the um, Serpent Mound in Ohio. They say, are there, are there mysteries and treasure? So, Brian, lame and naive as I am, I said, well, yeah, okay. Um, these things are cultural and historical treasures, and it's a mystery why more people don't know about them. They were not buying what I was selling. <laughs> they said, no, 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 no. Like, like, how about giants or aliens? And I said, no, no, that's the whole point of my show would be the real deal archaeology. What you're talking about is fantasy. I'm talking about real archaeology. And they just shake their heads and they go, well, but what sells is treasure and fantasy. And yeah. that's the last I hear from them. So, I mean, part of it is they just have an incredibly low opinion. Maybe it's, maybe it's reasonable of the viewing public. So they don't think that people would turn on to a show where it would be real deal archaeology, where we, this is what we really do know. And to have archaeologists who do the research, who are being taught, no, they're not, they're not, they don't think. And part of this is, you know, if a show is successful on cable, then every other production company in the world says, let's do that. Let's do that show. Only we'll change, we'll, we'll change this a little bit. We'll change this a little bit. We'll do 120% of that because that's been successful. Yeah. But they're not willing to start to try something completely different. We had about many years ago, uh, a group of us put together a TV pilot called The Skeptologist. And we actually okay. went to the expense and made an hour long pilot. Wow. And so we had um, six or seven scientists. It was like Steve Novella and Michael Shermer and all of uh -huh. these guys. And the idea, kind of the, the idea of our pitch was, 
This was like Queer Eye meets the Super Friends, okay? You all got right. the experts in all the various areas. They see the bat signal. They jump in the car and race off to the pseudoscience to debunk yeah. it, right? Uh -huh. And we we're going to have all the popular pseudosciences and everything. We thought we put together what we thought was a pretty good pitch. And we were fortunate to have a really good agent representing it. And so we had sure. meetings with all the networks. And it went very far with two networks. We got really? damn close to a deal. We lost a slot on Discovery Channel to Harry Bikers. So, uh, well, but yeah. Well, I mean, here, look. Which one are you going to want to watch, Skeptics uh, or Harry Bikers? Come I'd have tuned in to see just how Harry. But... <laughs> Here was the here was the key piece of feedback, and we got this kind of like this was the end of the road at every production company or at every network. They wanted to know the paranormal explanation is going to turn out to be the true one at least some of the time, right? right. Yes. And again, yeah. we're we're in the same position as you were trying to make the excuse. No, because blah 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 things that they didn't want to hear. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, was, it was very they explicitly said to me. Well, all right, we can let you debunk these things, but you have to leave the door open. Yeah. Well, there's no there's no door to leave open. <laughs> that's not the way science works. Like, yeah, oh yeah, we. But you know, Atlantis wasn't real, but you never know. No, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna prostitute myself to get a TV show by saying something that's patently not true. So, I mean, and, and then ultimately, when the, as the technology's gotten so good that maybe. We do just produce these things ourselves and put them on YouTube and bypass the, all of those filters that are looking for sensationalism. We think things are changing fast. I mean, uh, you know, network television is no longer where you would take a pitch like this. You would be going to Netflix and the right. Apple TV new network and, 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 exactly, and all yeah. of these things. It's uh, things are changing fast. And this democratization of content, I don't think is going to hurt us. I think it's going to help us. Just well, like really, podcasting. Yeah, I'm back in the day, like 20 years ago, when I would do like a, a, stand, a talking head thing for cable. The yeah. camera they brought was this hundred thousand dollar behemoth. Yeah. The last time you know, people are using, you know, SLRs. Yeah, I mean, they're doing their, they're using it, and the and the the quality, the resolution is really freaking great. So you know, you can afford to do this on the cheap. And come up with with content, with great content, but also a look that's really pretty good. We're getting there. Yeah. Well, Ken, this has been great. The time literally flew by. It didn't literally yeah. fly. I misused the word literally. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, we are out of time. So I really want to thank you very so very much yeah. for coming on and being great so great talking to you, Brian. Absolutely. And okay. I didn't say any swear words. And my you know <laughs> my, my my peeps are going to be really disappointed. But fuck them. Thank you.